Hi, I'm Dan Sweet with Helicopter Association International. Welcome to this week's at, uh, HAI at Work webinar. We have a uh, an interesting, fun topic. I think it's going to be fun because I'm, I'm not a pilot. But um, today we're going to be talking about designated pilot examiner pet peeves. And this is a course that was offered at Heli Expo. It was very popular, and we knew that we thought uh, we knew we should be able to try and get this message out further. And so uh, we asked uh, Randy Sharkey, the instructor of the uh, uh, program, to come on and give his presentation to all of you today. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, speaker today is Randy Sharkey. He is a chief pilot and FAA designated pilot examiner and pilot check airman for Sweet Helicopters. He is rated as a dual airline transport pilot. Um, he's accumulated over 13,000 hours in both uh, airplanes and helicopters. And he began flying in 1985, flying business jets for large corporate companies. In 2013, Randy was hired as the first full-time pilot for Sweet Helicopters. And in addition to seeing uh, overseeing their team of professional pilots, Randy uh, did fly VIP trips for the company. Um, as a commercial helicopter flight instructor, Randy has conducted over a thousand flight hours of dual instrument, dual flight instruction, and represents the Federal Aviation Administration as a helicopter designated pilot examiner. Once again, why he's here. <clears throat> Randy is the director in charge of Sweet Helicopter Satellite Base at the Goshen Municipal Airport in Indiana, where he also serves as the airport manager. Randy's active on many board positions, including the Enstrom Helicopter uh, Corporation, America's Freedom Fest, Rotors and Ribs, which is coming up in July in Goshen, Indiana, and Friendship Flights Foundation. And Randy and his wife, Elaine, have three grown daughters and four grandchildren. Uh, our webinars are interactive. We do want you to ask questions. This might be your only chance in advance of uh, taking a, a flight examination to ask a DPE some questions. Feel free. Uh, we're going to have time at the end. We should have plenty of time at the end for you to ask questions. We do ask that you use the question module within um, Zoom. Uh, the chat feature we will pay attention to, but uh, we give most of our attention to the qu uh, question module, so please use it. Uh, these webinars are being recorded. We do uh, try to make these available within 24 hours, but sometimes technology uh, gets the better of us and we have to wait till the following week. Uh, knowing next week in uh, the US is a holiday on Monday, it might be Tuesday before we get it posted. It will go to our YouTube channel and to our webpage as soon as we possibly can. So that said, let's go ahead and get things started. Randy, can you bring up your camera? You bet. How are you doing, Welcome. Dan? We're doing well. Welcome to uh, HAI at Work webinar. I got to ask right off the bat, being a grandfather, does that make being a DPE easier? Or as a DPE, does that make a, being a grandfather easier? Uh, let's go with uh, being a DPE makes a grandfather easier. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. In fact, my, uh, my oldest daughter is uh, on her way from Indianapolis up to our house as we speak. So soon after this webinar, I'm headed home. Sounds good. I will turn off my camera and be ready to go here very shortly. All right. Well, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak today, Dan. This is a this is a big deal. I hope that your viewers uh, find today's program both educational and entertaining. Today's presentation, you know, it's it's designed for a number of different pilots, but I think specifically, probably students. Future students and flight instructors will probably get the, uh, the most out of it. It should be noted that the top 10 pet peeves are just mine only, and they do not represent any other DPEs. I have a lot of friends that are uh, pilot examiners, and this is just my idea, and certainly it does uh, no way represent any of the uh, FAAs. The sole intent here is to help educate students and flight instructors on providing rotor tips that could be helpful on any uh, upcoming check rides. I, uh, I want to mention that the guy who is in the video uh, along with me kind of plays uh, opposite. His name's Chris Hauser. He's a friend of mine. Chris uh, has worked as a flight instructor for us in the past and also a 135 pilot, and he's currently an air medical pilot crew member. But you'll get a, you'll get a kick out of Chris, and when you see him on the video here, uh, man, the dude's got just a, a great sense of humor. The video itself runs about 30 minutes, and uh, like Dan mentioned, I'm happy to stick around 
and uh, answer any questions, Dan, that anybody might have. So based on that, take it away. Okay, let's go ahead and see if I can hit all the buttons correctly to share uh, Randy's video coming up now. I'm Randy Sharkey, and we are inside the Sweet Helicopter Hangar, located in Goshen, Indiana. In just a few minutes, we will push the aircraft outside and get started on our journey to successfully passing your next practical test. Sweet Helicopters is owned and operated by Chuck Surak, who also happens to be a commercial helicopter pilot himself. Sweet Helicopters corporate headquarters and maintenance facility are located in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Today, we are going to produce a video called Rotor Tips. In this video, you will view 10 tips on helping students pass their rotorcraft practical test. Last year, Kenny Keller, creator of Helicopter Online Ground School, did a 10-part series on the top 10 pet peeves as a DPE. Now we've taken that series and redefined it into the latest rotor tips. We hope that you find them helpful. If nothing else, I hope you enjoy the ride in our Augusta 109S. Kenny has cameras positioned in different places throughout the aircraft to give you some great angles. Now, I do have to mention this disclaimer. Today's rotor tips are not mandated by the FAA, and they are only to serve as an educational guideline as you prepare to take your practical rotorcraft test. Welcome aboard our Augusta 109S. It is one of three twin-engine helicopters here in our sweet helicopter VIP fleet. Joining me up front on this flight is no stranger to twin-engine helicopters, Kenny Keller. Kenny will be uh, flying along with us, and uh, here eventually he is going to uh, take the controls, and I am going to list our newest top 10 rotor tips for passing your next practical test. Our first rotor tip, it doesn't require any studying at all. And it should be a given, but unfortunately for many people, it is not. So let's bring it to the forefront, and that is first impressions. It seems like there are acronyms for everything in aviation, right? Let's pick one for first impressions because it includes three separate subjects that I want to talk about. Let's use OAT. Now, for many of you pilots, OAT, it stands for outside air temperature. But for the purpose of this conversation, let's make OAT, OAT, stand for this. O is organized. A, appearance. And T, timeliness. Check out this video on how not to participate in OAT. We're down to the checklist now where I need to identify you. So I need a photo ID, your FAA medical, and your current pilot's license. All right. So if you could get those to me, I will run out, make a copy. All right, let me look and, for all that uh, stuff. Okay, Where's sounds my good. License? Again, I apologize for being late. I was, there's my license. I was out with the friends last night and I forgot to set my alarm and it was a late night and we're, uh oh. What's wrong? Uh, I thought my medical was in here. Hang on, let me see if I can find my medical. Okay. 
So, uh, so far I have your, your driver's license for Indiana, so uh, I... Let me... I still need an FAA medical. Oh, there's my... A, there's my student. pilot's license. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, man, I don't know what I do with my medical. Maybe I should have stayed home last night. I don't... I got all this stuff ready. I don't... Hang on, hang on. Is there a way to get it if I don't have it? No, I have to have your medical. Oh, Are you sure you packed it? Yeah, I think. You look. A, I don't know why it's. You look a little unorganized. Well, I yeah, like I said, it was spare the moment going out last night. Oh, there it is. Let's make sure it's valid. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. There All you right. go. Okay. So, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, All right. I apologize. I, okay. I will go make copies, and I will be right back. Okay. Oh man, this is not going well so far. Hope it gets better. What else could go wrong? Organized. In the video, you saw our applicant is clearly not organized. His papers are scattered throughout the video. He has difficulty locating the documents needed to identify himself, and that includes the FAA medical and the pilot's license. A, his appearance. Now, wearing a t-shirt, shorts, and flip-flops is probably just slightly too relaxed, but I'm also not advocating that you need to show up in a three-piece suit or a dress. So, how about somewhere in the middle? I think they call it business casual, which might be appropriate. Uh, you know, maybe khakis and a, a polo shirt would be ideal. So, appearance, that's important. And lastly, on out, it's timeliness. Timeliness, it, it falls under first impressions. My recommendation is to maybe 30 to 60 minutes before the scheduled appointment with the examiner. That way, you can take your time and you can relax. You'll get there plenty early and you can get things set up, maybe look around the, uh, the building that you're meeting and if this is your first time there, you'll want to find out where the coffee pot is and maybe where the restrooms are at and that will just help you be relaxed as well. So, again, we're talking about OAT, organized, appearance, and timeliness. And if you follow those three suggestions, I can almost assure you it will help reduce the stress. More on stress coming up. Our next rotor tip is know the PTS book inside and out. There are no secrets with this one. The FAA publishes exactly what the applicant should be studying for and what to expect on the check ride. One of my personal pet peeves is when a flight instructor calls me, uh, maybe the day before the check ride, and will say something like this. Hey, my student wants to know what areas of operation that he or she should be studying for for tomorrow's check ride. Yeah, I'm just sitting here. I'm all anxious about the check ride tomorrow. Hey, I was thinking, what am I supposed to study exactly? I don't, I don't, I, there's so much stuff that we covered. I just didn't know what to, to look at. PTS, what are you, post-traumatic something or other? Oh, the practical test standards. Yeah, I think I got that book. It's a small little book that you, that's the test? Oh, yeah, okay. I'll, I think I got it. I'll open it up and see. Does it talk about like it covers like systems for aircraft and weather and all right what should i wear i mean should i because i just want to be comfortable i'm gonna be all nervous anyway i heard that examiner is real stickler yeah he only passes like one out of a hundred or something all right so cover the practical test standards and just review like systems of the aircraft and weight and balance and all that right all right all right practical test standards i got it got it that's the exam all right got it all right i appreciate it thanks my response is the same Every time, it's very simple, whatever is in the PTS works well for everyone. Additionally, whatever questions that the applicant has missed on the knowledge test will be incorporated into the oral questioning. Now, say for example that the applicant maybe missed three questions regarding airspace. There really is a high probability that during the oral questioning portion of the test that we are going to talk about airspace. So, what do they need to study for? You don't need to call me and ask. Just make sure that they are aware of the practical test guide. It's all fair game. Whatever in there 
is fair game. Now, again, we can't ask everything that's in that book because it would take a couple of days to go through it. But there are no surprises. What's ever in the PTS will, will likely, uh, or areas of it, will show up on the practical test. Our next rotor tip is talking about the IACRA login and password or at least the struggles with the uh, ACRA login and password. I have spent literally countless hours with applicants not knowing how to log in to this government website. And it really shouldn't be that difficult. However, you will be shocked how painful that this step can be for the applicant. And what I have found for those that struggle with that login procedure is that the stress level goes up. And any time the stress level goes up is when we start to lose some of the focus. So this note to the instructors, make sure that they know how to uh, log in to IACRA. And the purpose of that is that the applicant needs to sign electronically the 8710 form. It's just part of the pretest protocols that the applicant has to do on this government website. And sadly, after three attempts, the website will lock the applicant out. And I've had this happen a few times. I'm sure other DPEs will uh, attest to this too. And it could delay the test uh, an hour, maybe a, a couple hours. All right, Mr. Hauser, we are all the way down now to where you need to log into the 8710 and sign it for me. So uh, looks like you don't have an iPad or anything. So no. I'll just let you use my laptop so I am logged out and I will now just turn this around and I'll let you log in and then you can sign it electronically. Okay. Most guys have their password written down someplace. Oh, I always remember my password. You got it? Okay. Because yeah, yeah, a, yeah. a, lot, a lot of people struggle here. Yeah. So yeah, I'm glad you came prepared and have it ready to go. All right, yeah, go ahead. No problem. Yep, go ahead. Uh, oh, that that didn't work. Um, okay, keep in mind you're only allowed three chances, and yeah. it, it will lock you out. Okay, no, let me let me try again then. Hang on. Okay, all right. I'm pretty sure this is it. Okay, good deal. All right, yeah. all right. Here yep. we go. Here we go. Here we go. Excellent. Okay. Uh, what? No. Are you locked out? It's telling me that I've got to do a password recovery and call. I think. <sighs> I apologize. I guess I probably should have wrote that down or had it somewhere. All right. Hi, I need help. So again, this is just a it's just a recommendation to uh, make sure that as an instructor you have you have prepped your student well enough, and this one's pretty easy. Just write it down someplace. Write down the login and the password, and uh, this will go just so much easier for it. Our next rotor tip is talking about nerves. Everybody's nervous when they come to check rides, and as examiners, we understand that. Undoubtedly, the biggest obstacle is to overcome those nerves on check ride day. Here are just a, a couple of ideas that have really been successful for me. Arrive early and get everything organized on the table in front of you. If this is an unfamiliar place, take time to walk around and know your surroundings. And then go back to the meeting room, sit down and relax. This is not the time for last minute study. This is the time that you need to do whatever helps you relax. Now, some people have earbuds with soft music playing before the examiner arrives. Okay, so the examiner is there now. Maybe do some small talk with him before the test begins. You can talk about your families. You can talk about aviation. Everybody likes to talk about aviation, right? So maybe do that. Uh, this is also big that I have found that works is don't tell the world of the day of your check ride. In fact, maybe keep it a secret. And that way, if things don't work out exactly like you had hoped it would, you don't have to go back and tell anybody about it. I saw the, uh, I saw the Instrum sitting out there, and uh, man, what a great looking helicopter. So yeah, let's just figure out uh, what you know in reference to the uh, aircraft itself. 
You brought the uh, 280FX. Can you tell me what the maximum gross weight of the aircraft is? That includes like fuel, right? And, and luggage and all that together? Normally. Um, yes. I want to say it's like, man. I want to say it's like 27,000 pounds. No, not 27,000. Like 2,700 maybe. Somewhere in there, give or take. The density altitude maybe. Somewhere in there. What do you yeah, let's, I mean, uh, what, what do you think? I mean, what would, what would you suggest? <laughs> what do I think? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I think, but uh, well, I guess right now let's I'll tell you going. what, Mr. Trucky, I'm just what? I'm just so nervous. I've, you look you you look I'm, nervous. So what's uh, I told I told my friends and my family. I told everybody about this check ride today, and so I just really have to you know do well and pass. And I you know I told my girlfriends like after I pass we'll fly down and, and we'll go get dinner somewhere. And I, so I'm just really I feel like I you know I, I just got all this pressure and I just you know maybe I'm just not. <sighs> Part, part of passing a check ride is being able to control your own nerves, and you got off to a, a rough start just because you were about 20 minutes late. So, keep it a secret. Also, part of the briefing is to let the applicant know that perfection is not the standard. It's what we will tell the applicant, and, and what does that mean? It means that you aren't expected to know every answer that is asked of you. I had an applicant, oh, I think it was this past month, that uh, said to me, uh, oh, man, I can't, I'm drawing a total blank. Can I call a friend? Well, I can't exactly let you call a friend, but what I can do is have you take time and look at your notes or, or go to your book and look it up, and, and that's okay. You know, we, we expect that. There are times that it's perfectly fine to, uh, to go to your notes or go to the book. What I would encourage you to do is don't try to bluff the examiner because he's going to figure that out pretty quick. So be honest. Just let him know that oh, I, you forgot that one, you've talked about it, but you just can't think of it. And I'm, I'm pretty confident as long as you're not doing it every couple of minutes that uh, he'll, let you, uh, he'll let you do that. I have found that those applicants that have gotten off to a good, solid start are those applicants that have showed up on time that are organized and confident in their knowledge of their aircraft. Those ones that have prepped hard the day before the check ride. That has always worked out well by following those rules, I believe also will help calm those nerves. Our next rotor tip is where are all of your endorsements? This one is the responsibility of your flight instructor. It's his or her responsibility to make sure you have all the proper endorsements that have been signed with the corresponding FAR. A good source is the advisory circular 6165. It's dated August of 2018. Or just simply search FAA piloted endorsements. It's also not a bad idea to tab out the requirements in part 61. This will help the examiner verify that you meet the requirements of 61-109. And our next rotor tip is talking about a lack of knowledge on the maintenance records. I believe that more time needs to be spent from flight instructors on this topic because logbooks are so valuable that we are finding more flight schools and owners of helicopters are reluctant may be hesitant to let those maintenance logbooks leave the building or come out of the safe. But as a result, I've also seen that applicants are really weak in that area. Okay. So would the sheet, would it say like annual on the sticker? Um, have you, have you seen these before? Uh, sir, I gotta be honest with you. I've, I've never seen this book before. I've. Uh, You've never yeah. seen a maintenance log book before. No, I. Okay. Uh, you know, every time I'd show up at, for training, we, you know, the instructor, you know, we would do a little bit of ground, then we would go fly for an hour and a half, and and I would ask every once in a while, and he would just say, "Oh, we'll do it next time." And of course, I'm at a, you know flying for a flight at a flight school, and mm -hmm. they keep them locked up in their maintenance bay or whatever, and. And it just okay. seems like every time I'd say something, it was always, oh, how okay. about we do it next time or, you know, and then. Okay. So I got I to gotta be honest with you, this is, 
first time I've seen this book. Okay. And, all right. So uh, let's take a break. I will uh, get a hold of your instructor, and we will see where to go from here. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. So what I would like to see are instructors to go get the maintenance log books, get them out of the safe, again, take good care of them, and sit down with your students and go through it and make sure they know the difference between what an annual is and what a 100-hour inspection might be. Point out the pedal static inspections. I have found that some flight schools will send along a, a status sheet it's typically just a one-page document, and on that sheet, it will show me when the annual was done, that 100-hour was done, maybe the component times. It summarizes everything, but again, it is not a substitute for the maintenance law books themselves. So, my recommendation on this one to you instructors are to spend more time with your students in the maintenance log books. Our next rotor tip is to know your aircraft. Some of the best applicants that I've seen over the years are those that are really, really familiar with the Rotorcraft flight manual, the RFM or the POH, whatever you want to call it. Those applicants that show up in their own aircraft, well, they probably have a slight advantage over someone who is renting from the local flight school. This happens to be one of my least favorite statements from the applicant. And that is, well, this is probably the last time I'll be flying this make and model because I'm buying my own helicopter when I get home. So what they really are trying to imply is that they really don't need to be that familiar with the helicopter that they showed up for in the check ride. And uh, I want to let the applicants know that this is really incorrect thinking. You should treat that this make and model, honestly, is the one that's going to get you safely home by yourself if you happen to have flown to the check ride that day. I, uh, I hear the excuse a lot when they say, well, you know, I'm just here long enough to get transitioned into the aircraft. I want to use this helicopter to take a check ride in. I really want them to understand and to, to know the aircraft. Uh, I feel that the uh, emergency procedures in the RFM are very important. I will ask applicants uh, if this specific light illuminates, what does it mean? And what is the pilot's corrective action? Because in the event of an actual emergency, you will not have time to refer to the RFM for guidance. All right, let's just talk about the emergency section of the, um, of the 280FX. Okay. What happens if this red light comes on when you're flying? It's going to be up here on the enunciator panel. So it's this specific red light. Tell me what the pilot's corrective action is when you see that light. Oh, I'm going to just start praying. I'm just probably not, I'm probably going to tell my passengers that we're probably going down. I mean, red means bad. So, typically, but this red light itself, what, what does that indicate? What is that? Is that the low rotor RPM? Mm -hmm. Oh, that means that the rotor is spinning way too fast. Uh, that the, oh, low. God, see, I can't even think straight. Low rotor, duh. Low rotor means that the, the rotor is not spinning fast enough. Yeah, let's just uh, stop here for a second okay. and uh, let's yeah, talk I, about how a, this is going. You mind if I take a break? Yeah. Can, I, can I go to the bathroom yeah, or something? Yeah, right, get going. Hang on, all right. You know, we're only 500 feet above the ground. We're 1,000 feet above the ground. In the event of an engine failure, you won't have time to go grab the RFM and uh, reference it. So there are certain portions of the emergency section that I feel that you, need, you do need to memorize and uh, not only to pass the uh, oral portion of the test, but even more importantly, it could save your life. So, please, know your aircraft. Our next rotor tip is, uh, the winds are so much stronger that, than I'm used to. If I had a dime for every time that an applicant blamed the winds as a reason for their 
four performance. I would encourage the applicants to uh, fly with their instructors on the windy days and the gusty days. I know it's easy to cancel on those days, but if check ride day happens to be a little windier day, they really can't be using the winds as an excuse for their poor performance. And I've seen that from time to time. And as helicopter pilots, we can use the winds uh, to our favor uh, for some of the tasks that are going to be conducted that day. I'll talk to an instructors right here. If if you feel the winds are really gusty and you know maybe uh, severe, too strong, yeah, it's okay to cancel that. What I'm talking about is don't be afraid to fly on those days where the winds are gusting up over 20 knots because there probably will be a day that your student is going to have to fly in conditions like that. So it's important to fly in all types of weather conditions. The winds are much stronger than I'm used to. Keep that in mind, instructors, and let's try to fly with the students, even on some of the windier days. Our next rotor tip is, can I use my iPad in place of paper? And my answer is, you bet. However, don't let an electronic device become your worst enemy. An airplane DPE colleague told me that his applicant iPads froze during a simulated ILS approach and the applicant did not have a backup. And when the examiner asked him to execute the missed approach procedure, well, guess what? The applicant also froze, and that check ride ended soon thereafter. I also had an applicant that was using his electronic device for a weight and balance calculation, only discover that it was using the incorrect starting numbers for the empty weight and moment. Sadly, he was using the sample numbers that were printed in the RFM and not the actual weight and balance that was printed on the separate weight balance page. So, again, electronic devices are permissible for the practical test. I encourage them, in fact, because I do feel that they're more accurate when properly utilized. Just make sure that you have a backup plan and most certainly have a clear understanding of how to do a weight balance by longhand in the event that you're asked to do it. So, can I bring the iPad? Absolutely. Question traffic helicopter 50 we're on the right downwind for runway 9 and we'll be number 2 for the airport. Alright, you're below 100 knots, here comes the gear. 3 green, I see him, you see him? Yep. And we go to 102% on the RPM. Landing gear is down, three green. RPM switch 102, radar is off, never used it. Uh, brakes are off. Those wheel steering, off. You're good to land. You got the diamond out there? Yep, I got yep. it, you're good. Uh, checks everything's down, looking good. Mr. Show Off. <laughs> all right, go up all the way down. Beautiful. And our last rotor tip is talking about you just passed the oral. Congratulations. Now it is time to fly. Tell the examiner that you would like to take a small break before flying. Use this time to catch your breath, grab a snack, and make sure to stay hydrated. Use your iPad to check the current METAR know the surface winds and go over in your mind how you're going to hover taxi for the takeoff. Know the notams for the airport and the airspace around you. As you pre-flight the aircraft, make sure to take your time. Have that checklist in your hands at all times and reference it. And do one final walk around before entering the aircraft to confirm that all of the doors are now closed and latched. Use the checklist for your engine start. Again, you'll want to listen to the AWOS or ASOS to verify the winds. Speak clearly on the Uticom or the tower frequency. And remember, you can't do anything too slow. Did I mention to use the checklist? Before placing the checklist down prior to takeoff, do one last final pre-takeoff check. I had an applicant try to take off with me with the boost pump off and the red light staring right at him. Yes, he had to come back later, but I felt bad for him because he was so nervous 
and he was carelessly rushing through the checklist that he had overlooked that he had left the pump in the off position. So, anyhow, uh, that is the, the rotor tip that we want to talk about after you've got through your uh, oral portion of the test. So, let's recap the rotor tips. First, impressions. Remember the acronym OAT, O-A-T. Organized, appearance, timeliness. Know your maintenance records. Maybe grab a status sheet to take with you. Know your iAcura login and password. Write it down, whatever it takes to have it with you. Thoroughly know the PTS. Anything in there is fair game for the examiner. Know your aircraft. Memorize the emergency procedures when necessary. Know the limitation section like the back of your hand. Know the different sections in the POH or RFM and what each section represents. Fly on the windy days and don't be intimidated with stronger winds. Use the winds in your favor. Make sure that your iPad is charged and ready to go. Do you have the correct weight and balance in your iPad? What is your backup? Paper? or another electronic device. Have something to fall back on. Have your instructor confirm and reconfirm the proper endorsements. Too many check rides never get started due to incorrect endorsements. This does add to the stress level if the instructor has to get involved at the last minute to make those corrections. Calm the nerves. What is relaxing to you? Everyone has a different way of relaxing. Figure it out before check ride day, and for heaven's sakes, don't tell everybody the day of your check ride. Be organized, be early, be smart, be confident, be a safe pilot. One word, checklist, period. Use your checklist. And remember, you can't do anything too slow in the helicopter. I truly hope in some small way that this video has helped you. Here's to much success and stay flying. Live to fly another day. Helicopter. Okay. I am not a pilot, but now I want to be a pilot. That was wildly entertaining and so informative, uh, Randy. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, you're very kind, Dan. You're very kind. Let Something me, tells me I'll never become an actor. <laughs> Actually, I thought you did quite well with that. Oh, the uh, other guy's good. <laughs> uh, I, well, the question I kept having over and over is, man, I hope Randy gets paid by the hour for these things. I know it's satire, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if, if you're not getting paid by the hour, hey, man, I think you're uh, it's, you're missing out on something. Uh, um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Actually, so let me ask, um, I know you've given this at uh, Helicopter Association International Heli Expo at least once. The fact that you made a recording of it means you've shared it probably other places. What kind of feedback have you gotten from students, pilots who have reviewed your uh, advice and yeah. then taken their exam? Yeah, it's all been positive, Dan. I mean, uh, again, these are just my suggestions, uh, but I think generically speaking, that it's been helpful to them, and uh, you know maybe the uh, maybe the most help would be the uh, the one talking about the nerves. That is that's probably one of the most common denominators that I see each uh, each check ride is everybody's nervous, and and I totally get that. Uh, yes. Nobody likes to be tested, and so just just find a way to you know to to stay calm. It's, it's sometimes mean? difficult. Is that more common with uh, newer pilots, uh, lower hour pilots, or is it uh, go across the board based on experience? It, it's it's across the board. Uh, 18 year olds all the way up to 70 year olds. They just seem to be uh, nervous. And, you know, typically the uh, the pro pilots that come that do the add on ratings, which I get a lot of that for helicopter uh, check rides. It may be a, a professional airline pilot, and he's just doing a uh, an add-on, maybe a private add-on. They're they're the ones that seem to be the most calm because they're tested every six months, every nine months, whatever the case. 
Uh, but it's, uh, you know, maybe the, uh, maybe the newer, younger private pilots would be probably more prone to the nerves. We did have a question. Somebody was wondering, since you're a DPE for a specific area, you know, more or less, um, do you work with students that uh, come from a number of, you know, the, the same instructors? And if they come unprepared regularly, do you go back to the instructor? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. I have, uh, I think there's three or four flight schools here in the northern half of Indiana. And, you know, I, I tend to know most of the instructors and they know what my expectations are. Yeah, but certainly if uh, if I see a, a weakness, uh, it, it, it has to be addressed. And uh, typically you start with the instructor. Um, somebody else, I, you know, right off the bat, uh, one of the very first questions we got was regarding the attire. And knowing that we're approaching the summer months here in the northern hemisphere and uh, cockpits can get pretty warm, yeah. um, do you consider dress shorts and a polo appropriate? Maybe not absolutely. Like pants. Absolutely. Yeah. When I reviewed that video, you know, I think that was shot in the wintertime. Uh, shorts were never a uh, consideration. Absolutely. Shorts are perfectly fine. Yes. Because uh, uh, a lot of these two-place helicopters, uh, they do get very toasty. So, yeah, please... Uh, if if I could if I could change something on there, it doesn't need to be khakis. Jeans are fine too. Uh, it's just uh, I, I I have had people show up with flip flops and like Chris had that day in shorts. That may be too relaxed. <laughs> well, yeah, again. Ju- you know I can't judge anybody on how they dress. You know I I'm not gonna you know I'm just telling I'm giving hints to uh, what might uh, get a uh, an applicant off to a better start. Well, and I understand that you did exaggerate a number of different factors just to help emphasize your point. Right, and I think right, that that's right. what uh, makes for an, an effective learning program. So, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, don't have very many other questions. It looks like maybe one's coming in right now, but um, okay. we did get some very positive comments. And um, it's very nice. I, just, Thanks, I know Dan. it's acting, but I can't watch this as an instructor. I never let anyone go that unprepared to an evaluation. <laughs> um, and then he said, "Also, this is an excellent presentation." So I suspect he, uh, you've got a, a new fan. Oh, he's, um, very, he's very kind, or she's very kind, whoever it is. Uh, we got a question from uh, Juan. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you very much for your dedication. I'd like to know your opinion about the difference in the requirements in a check between a C- CPLH and an ATPLH beforehand. The, uh, so yeah, the, uh, I noticed the bio had me doing uh, ATPs. All I do are just private and commercial check rides. Uh, so I would not be a, uh, a good judge on what the, uh, what the differences there are. But yeah, my, my certificate of authority allows me to do private check rides and commercial check rides. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I can't, I can't be much help there to one. I have a question from uh, James. Um, do you have any specific tips for a CFI check ride? CFI, yeah, I uh, I do have some specific tips for. Uh, I think the best thing for a commercial flight instructor uh, applicant is to practice with somebody on teaching, and uh, you have to be a good communicator. Uh, you have to be able to talk while you're demonstrating a maneuver. And um, and I think what makes a good flight instructor is somebody that has a passion to teach. Now, it doesn't mean you have to have a teaching degree by any sense of the imagination, but I think a passion for aviation and the uh, it just shows. And I think it makes you a better instructor. You know, it goes without saying how you've got to prepare. You know, that's a given. OK, let's let's just take that one off the table. Be prepared for that. But know the different ways to teach the knowledge that you have that you're going to teach to somebody. And if that means practicing uh, before the day of the check ride with a pretend student, I would encourage you to do that. Communicate. A, a good CFI is a good communicator. I know and this is just a personal question and just curiosity. Can you tell the difference between a, a, an instructor who has passion as opposed to an instructor who is just using the job to build hours? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And what it comes down to is one word. It's passion. Those that have a passion to teach are the ones that I can really tell a difference on. Those ones that just 
just love to teach other students to be uh, to be safe and to be successful uh, versus those that are just out to build the time for that next job. Oh yeah, I could tell the difference, you bet. A uh, question from Chris. Uh, do you wish to see all logbooks or just the most current with the appropriate endorsements? It depends if I've seen the aircraft in the past or not. Uh, if it's a new aircraft, I probably want to see all of them to, uh, to make sure that uh, it is as advertised. If it's an aircraft that shows up once a month uh, on my doorstep, yeah, just the most recent, just to confirm uh, that the annual is in fact done and all the inspections and ADs have been complied with. Would it hurt for a student to, uh, or a, uh, somebody who's coming in for a test to give you a call, let's say the day before to double check that to see if yeah, there's yeah, something sure, you need? Sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I would also encourage your, uh, the viewers, uh, the applicants, don't split the logbooks out. Don't bring just two of them out of the bag. I, I'd hate to see them get lost. I think it's best if we keep all the logs together. So either bring none or bring them all. And uh, I think most DPEs are going are to want to see all the logbooks. Yes. Okay. Um, that kind of looks like everything we've got in today. So let's finish up with uh, the question I do ask uh, everybody at the end of webinars. If there was one thing that you, one message you wanted to give to somebody to walk away with today, what's the one bit of advice that you feel maybe the the, the biggest, most important thing you can stress during uh, when you're giving an exam? Yeah. So, you know, we, we titled this at one point, the top 10 pet peeves of a DPE. We've called them rotor tips as well. I think the the one thing that, that we're going to stress here today is when you go for a check ride, just be prepared. Be prepared, uh, whether it's a private add-on, whether it's a, a CFI, ATP. I think the one thing that I want to stress is be prepared as you can be. And a lot of those tips that we just provided doesn't require any studying. It's just, uh, it's just simple tips. And uh, I think if you look at them, including the one that talks about the IACRA login and password, it's pretty easy. Just write it down someplace and take it with you. So uh, yeah, if you want me to summarize it, Dan, be prepared, show up, be prepared. Uh, we did get one more question in from Jan. Uh, just hey, Jan. throw that in there. How important is it in flight communications with the DPE if the student discovers deviations from a parameter such as altitude? For example, I'm 60 feet too high. Uh, whatever the practical test guide, uh, all I'm is, all I'm doing is I'm an observer. I'm taking what's given to me from the FAA as a guideline, and I have to follow that. If we're talking about 60 feet, uh, uh, chances are, you know, as long as they're correcting, uh, they're probably well within the limits to begin with. But yeah, I'm just an observer, and uh, I've got a I've got a guideline that I have to follow. Okay, Randy. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, honestly, it's been a true pleasure uh, to work with thank you. you I, I, I love uh, learning things and about this industry still after almost 30 years. And uh, you made it a lot uh, a lot more fun for uh, somebody who doesn't doesn't fly at all. So well, well, I guess what I would encourage you, Dan, is go take a discovery flight somewhere in a helicopter and uh, let's get your license one of these days. I, I kind of like that idea. Thank you so let's, much, Randy. All right, man. Uh, please enjoy your uh, afternoon. So let's Thanks. go ahead and get things wrapped up here. Save the dates. We do have some webinars coming up. Um, looking uh, for the next two of them. Uh, June 8th, guess what? I'm going to teach the class this time. Um, it's a class that I also have taught at uh, Heli Expo the last couple of years. We are trying to expand some of our um, courses that we offer for small businesses. And we know that not everybody has time to attend Heli Expo. We know that everybody doesn't have time to attend classes. But we know that small business owners especially have so many hats that they may not be able to specialize in anything. Crisis Communications is a course that nobody wants you to uh, use, but you need to be prepared. The speed of social media today creates a massive media vacuum that somebody else will fill. And if you have an accident or incident that you need to address with the media, you need to be prepared in advance. And so I'm gonna go through uh, some of my uh, best tips on how to uh, handle that. And June 22nd, uh, towards the end of the month there, we have a great uh, webinar from our VAST safety team. 
presentation last year on how safe is your shop. So we'll be looking into some human factors into the shops. HAI does like to share information. Um, webinars are one way we do it. Heli Expo, there's plenty of places we do it as well. Another way we do it is through uh, the media. We produce a Rotor Daily. It's uh, some of the 10 to 15 to 20 top stories involving the vertical aviation uh, field every business day. It comes directly to your email box, usually uh, midday on the East Coast. Uh, we try to shoot for noon. And it's, uh, it, it's like you're doing your own Google search, except we've done it for you on what is the helicopter news of the day. We cover safety topics. We cover industry topics. We cover regulatory and government affairs. Uh, we try to tell you what HAI is doing in advance as well. So it's a great thing and it's free. All you have to do is sign up with your email address. Rotor Magazine, an award-winning publication that comes out every quarter, um, has a lot more in-depth uh, information uh, on a variety of topics from subject matter experts who are happy to share their information. It too is free right now. Um, there is a cost if you are an international subscriber. We do ask for a small stipend to uh, cover international mailing. Otherwise, all you have to do for it as well is sign up. You can sign up for both of them at rotor.org slash subscribe. I believe we'll have a questionnaire coming out. I just discovered recently that uh, I'm not sure those have been coming out. We still like to know what uh, you think about the webinars and what uh, ideas you might have for upcoming topics. Uh, please feel free. We, if you do get the uh, uh, survey, just let us know uh, what you think and what we could do better. Same with HAI in general. We're a membership-based organization. It's important that we're meeting your requirements as that organization. Are we doing things that you need us to do? Is there something we should be doing different? Is there something we're doing better? Are you happy with the way we're doing things? Feedback is the best way to tell us. Um, and the great easy way to do that is to send Jim Viola, our president and CEO, an email. His email address, president at rotor.org, is open to everybody. Uh, send him an email, let him know what you think. He does send those around to staff for tasking if it's appropriate. So uh, please let us know. And that does wrap us up for today. I am grateful that you took time out of your busy schedule to uh, view this webinar. Randy Sharkey, thank you so much. That was a brilliant presentation. I think I will go take a discovery flight and we'll see everybody again uh, here in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much.